welcome into our Cubs Recap Podcast, a presentation of our Recap YouTube channel and available audio only anywhere you find your favorite podcast with my partner, Gordon Wittenmeyer. I'm David Kaplan. All right, G, let's get into this. Oh, look at that. He's got his Washington Huskies mug up. Boy, you're awfully chesty for a team. Or that's a football. Is that a football? Oh, it's, it's a football, football. pal. Yeah, I, you're awfully chesty for a team that's a nine and a half point underdog. A team that already beat the same opponent. Yeah, I was sense. there for that game. That line makes no sense, but we'll see. Um, so the winter meeting start on Sunday. We could start with pitching rumors out there. So I, heard, I talked to someone today. Said the Cubs are absolutely in on Tyler Glass now. They're doing extensive medical work. A lot of teams are. Yeah. He's going to make $25 million. Mm -hmm. He's never thrown more than 120 innings in his life in a season. He's two years out of Tommy John. And when he's right, he's really, really good. So we'll start with him. Shane Bieber, the Cubs are kicking the tires on. Other and teams on him too, in the division. Yeah. And Dylan Cease is out there. And John Morosi saying he could get moved, as I say, by Sunday. Braves, Dodgers are considered the front runners. So let's start with Glass now. And supposedly the White Sox aren't rebuilding. Is that is that is that what we're led to believe? Yeah, right. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, so let's talk about Glass now first. When you look at his numbers, he's never thrown more than 120 innings, and he's never been over 90 except one. But he's two years removed from Tommy John. He has electric stuff. And a lot of teams look at him and go, boy, if we can get him for 170 innings, we don't need him to throw 200. We might have an ace. Would you give up Christopher Morell in a deal like that? It's awfully yes. big risk. He's, a, he's got five years of control now. I, I would be, look, and by the way, I'll take 150 innings of him in today's game. And especially with the new manager they have, um, the way he, uh, the way he's operated his pitching staff in, in Milwaukee. So yes, I would do that because you got to win this year. You're on the clock and that's a guy, that's a high, high end guy that can help you do that. And it's, and, and, and it's a short term Big ticket contract, but short term, right? So he's off your books almost as fast as he's on your books. And he's able to maybe get you somewhere this year, which is or next year, which is the point. Um, Morell, nice player. He's got, I mean, when he connects, he's got serious pop. He's he's an athlete. He's also got swag, drip that your team no needs. No question. No question. And and I actually like that about the guy, whether the, the previous guys in charge of that team did or not. Um, but he's he doesn't have a uh, – gosh, who, who's the guy I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of? Um, but he, he's not – he plays a lot of positions, but he doesn't play anything especially well. And um, unless, unless you're going to get more out of him that way, this is a team built – on run prevention, and there are other solutions for what his bat might represent up and down your lineup as you mix and match um, than him. Uh, so I would say if you could, yes, it's five years of control, but you don't know how that's going to play out over the next five years because of some of the concerns with his glove maybe. And, and also, you know, he hasn't really had that chance yet, so we don't know what happens when he gets it. We have a pretty good idea what Glasnow gives you, uh, it, you know, assuming that uh, all the medicals check out on him. And, and it's so short term that you have an even better idea as a as a pitcher what you're getting out of him. Uh, it makes it makes him as as good a bet as you get with a high end starting pitcher. So, yes, I would do that. OK, so he started his career in 2016 with the Pittsburgh Pirates innings pitched. In his career, 23 and a third, 62, 56, 55, 60, 57, 88, 6.2, and then this year, 120 with an ERA this year uh, of 3.53. So if you're going to need him to pitch into deep October, 
And that's why you gave Craig Council $40 million. That's why you're trying to get Shohei Otani. That's why you're kicking the tires on all these big names in free agency. Can you count on that guy? You can't count on anybody, especially a pitcher, but you can count on him for one year. Again, if the medicals check out, you should be able to count on him for that one year. Now, how many innings? I don't know. Are you going to have to manage him toward the end of the year? If he, if he's, I mean, if he's, if you're having to manage him at the end of the year, because his innings are up there, that means he's pitching pretty damn well for you. True. Um, and, and so if that's the case, that's, that's not a, I mean, if, and if that's the worst case scenario, and obviously it's not, but if, if that's as bad as it gets with him having a healthy year for you, that's, that's a pretty good, uh, that's pretty good for a downside. Um, so, you know, there's a, a 389 career. I mean, he's had, you know, when he's pitched before, before the last, uh, you know, before he had the, the Tommy John, I mean, he, he looked really good. He's, he's, he is that good cap. Um, now that, that said, can you go out and you, you should be looking at him. But if you can go out and get one of those Japanese pitchers, um, and, and I don't maybe, have to give anybody up then to get him. It's just money, right? That's my point, and especially especially the big guy, uh, Yamamoto. So if if you're able to get him or or one of these other uh, you know higher higher end free agents, or even go out and get Eduardo Rodriguez, I, I like that guy. Um, you know, with with Aaron Nola off the board, with with that caveat, because I told you all along I liked him. Uh, then you know, go get one of the free agents. Go get a couple of the free agents, or 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 maybe get one free agent and get Glass. Now, I mean, look what what you have to. It looks like the Brewers are going to take a step back. They might even trade Corbin Burns. There's so much buzz on that. Would they trade him to the Cubs? <laughs> No freaking chance. Come on, man. Okay. There's no chance in hell, never mind the face of the earth, that that, that would happen. Not, not, not if you made the best deal for them. Well, for one thing, they're absolutely furious that you got Craig Council. They're not going to send you Corbin Burns. So uh, so no chance. But but even with the Brewers taking a step back, the Reds, the Reds this week signed a relief pitcher for $16 million for two years. Now there's an opt out in the deal, but they're serious about using some of their payroll flexibility to maybe sign a, a legit starting pitcher, maybe add a bat and definitely bolster the, the bullpen. And that's a team that, that, that was on the rise coming out of last year with a lot of young players and some more in that farm system. St. Louis already signed three guys. Well, they signed for- Kyle Gibson, Lance Lynn and Sonny Gray. Right. And and yeah, I like that. That, that is not a rotation, though, that strikes fear into people. They also say they're not done. So a guy like Lance Lynn, I don't expect him. I, I would assume he's not one of the three uh, frontline starters that they said they sought going in to the offseason. I would assume they're still in the market for more. They just jumped the market to get some of this depth that they've got. They're going to be back, man. They're going to be able to pitch and prevent some runs, and they got those two guys on the corners that they're start, still trying to, to to maximize while they got Goldschmidt and Arenado uh, in the fold. So they're going to be back. The Reds are going to be on the rise. Pittsburgh's a kind of a wild card, the way they started and the way they finished last year and with all their young talent. And then you got the Cubs. You got the Cubs that they got – they got a couple gold glovers in the right spots. They got some really nice pitching, not tons of depth in some of these areas, but they got one hell of a start if they use their resources right this offseason to fill in those gaps and add a frontline starter, maybe add another starter, take care of that bullpen, add a bat. They need a left-handed bat. I keep coming back to that. They need a left-handed bat. Well, then you're not going to get Pete Alonzo. Well, that's that's where I was going with that, right? Is it, you know, I keep hearing them connected to Pete Alonzo with, you know, nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't solve the left-handed bat issue. Unless you're adding two bats. Right, right. But because but if you need a, leaving, you have an opening at first, you have an opening at third, and you have an opening potentially either DH or center field. So are you trying to say Soto, Shohei, 
I do not I mean, think they're Alonso playing in that, in that Soto pool. I don't believe it. If they get him, great. He's a yeah. hell of a player, and he's young. He's 25 years old. I do think they're pulling out all the stops on Shohei Otani, but I consistently believe he's going to the Dodgers. Yeah. Until you I, prove to me otherwise. I actually agree with you on that. I do think that they're serious, and I do think that he's going to stay on the West Coast. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. It's four hours closer to get home to Japan. It's warm weather all the time. It's just it's a lot more conducive. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I, and, and, you know, and there is something about, you know, culturally speaking, I was talking to an agent that represents a, a lot of uh, Japanese uh, players um, recently. And um, culturally speaking, there, there is something about being that guy. That that alpha dog from your country when you're on a major league team over here, uh, as opposed to being one of two guys or three guys on that team, like you know, like him and Suzuki team. You know, some people think that having Suzuki here is an advantage, and there's parts of it that that would be with the familiarity and 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 some of the maybe team infrastructure that's already in place because you've got a, a Japanese player and you had Fukudomi before that and so on and so forth. Um, and Darvish, uh, but, um, but there is again, culturally this, this notion of, uh, you know, wanted to be, you know, that guy that, that means something, you know, so I don't know how much that comes into play. Uh, that, that's just one other thing that's out there that I've been told. I, I just wonder if, cause I keep hearing Suzuki is a very popular player in Japan mm -hmm. that having Suzuki Darvish speaks very, very highly of the Cubs, even though they traded him. He understood the business side of things. Could you convince Yamamoto and Otani to go, all right, we'll go play with Suzuki? The three of them here. We'll, uh, we'll create, we'll just take our world baseball classic team and put it in Chicago, we'll transplant it on the north side of Chicago. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there might there might be something in, and I don't know what I don't. I have no idea what the relationship is like between those guys. But if the relation, if there is a relationship there uh, between a couple of them, and 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 if it was something that was appealing and sort of, in sort of kind of doing something for the first time, like like really being a like you're talking about a, a serious Japanese presence on a team, like almost, almost pioneering in a way, like, like right. animating that team. Like um, we've seen teams do that with Cuban players. Right. Exactly. The White Sox uh, have a White history. Sox have done that very well with right. Luis Robert and some of these um, others. But can you imagine if you went, that. okay, Shohei, you got Suzuki and you got Yashinobu Yamamoto are all with you. That's right. And, and th so you guys are, the must watch television event every time you play in an entire country. Right. There's, there's very few split allegiances here. You're like, like you're all on the same team. You're, you're Japan's team. You're now Japan's team. Hey, and let me get Jed on the phone. <laughs> hey, Jed, Gordon and I have solved it. We're going to be team yeah. Japan here in Chicago. That's Sell right. that. Okay. That's wow. right. I need that to bring me. Freaking incredible. And you okay, steal each blow from the Mariners as a, as a coach. Yeah. Let's or, or as a player coach. Shit, that guy's still playing. Have you seen that? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Let's assume they don't get Otani. They don't get Yamamoto. They have money to spend. I felt like a year ago, you and I were talking on this podcast. We had just started it. And I kept saying to you, I keep hearing Ricketts wants to spend Jed is like, we're still a year away. And then they got aggressive and they went and got Dansby Swanson and they did this and they did that. They got Cody Bellinger. That worked out exceptionally well. He congrats to him, comeback player of the year. And now I feel like Jed is at the point where, all right, I've worked super hard to build this thing to this point. Now I'm ready to throw it in overdrive. Let's go. You think it's another year away? Well, I just don't think that's his personality. Uh, um, I think that he still... Or it's his owner's loves, personality, because I think his owner's ready to win. 
I, I, I think it's his owner's personality more than it's his personality. I think it's Theo's personality more than it's Jed's personality. I think that the idea of we might be on the brink of something, let's go all in. That, that I mean, that's Theo, man. Theo wants to go for the throat when, when he thinks it's within reach. But they went and got counsel. That is going for the throat. Well, that is Jed. No, no, think about it. It isn't, it isn't that in the sense of doing something dramatic, but it's also very, very much within character of looking at sustainability. Whether you were ready to win this year or start your serious winning next year, that move makes sense from a long term sustainability uh, perspective. And that's what I'm talking about. And now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they don't think they're ready to win in 2024. I think they are. I think they think that. I think they have to think that. I think they're on the clock and so on and so forth. But what I'm saying is that that is a classic Jed move in terms of it speaks to both now and five years from now. And 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 I so I do I don't think that necessarily says Jed's getting super aggressive and, and going for the throat at all costs and, and trying to do I think he's still gonna protect that farm system. Um, and, and you, we can, we can get into whether that's the right thing to do or not. I think, uh, no, I think he'll spend what he's given. Uh, I, I don't think that this is, uh, going to be, uh, well, let's artificially stay below the, the threshold just because, or, 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 you know, or what, what was that term they used to use? Keep our powder dry. Um, Correct. For 2025. I, I truly believe if it's July 29th and they're like, Okay, we can do this. There, Tom will spend whatever it takes to get there. I think that's where they are. I think that's that has to be where they are. But, but also, you know, I was just I was just looking, you know, since since Jed took over, they they they've got a, you know, they, they've been they've won seventy one, seventy four, and eighty three games. Even last year when they finished a game out of the playoffs, it was you know barely five hundred. You know, we want to talk about. Boy, Justin Steele and that middle infield and Bellinger had a great year and, and you know, they were right there. And my God, the team that beat them by a game wound up in the World Series. All of that's true, but it was still 83 wins. So so they've got a lot of work to do before you start penciling them in for a game in November. Right. And so I think. That's what they're going to try to accomplish this winter. It, all, all indications are that's what they're trying to accomplish this winter. And they've certainly set the baseline. But, man, I just – it's not like in, in 2015 they won 97 games the, the, when they were a year early, right? This is 83. And so uh, you know, it's not that same – team and and all those all those young players that were part of that world series team for the most part were on that 2015 team including the rookie of the year um so so uh it's it's certainly different than that and it, it this is still a growth process and i think to go back to what you said the owner may say hey let's do this the owner's not the guy on the ground with the experience of being a, a front office guy that builds teams. He's been around the game a lot. He hasn't gotten his hands dirty at that level. He's not a guy that grew up scouting players or evaluating or putting personalities together in a, in a clubhouse and all that. So I don't know how, I don't know that the Ricketts family doesn't believe that when it, okay, we want to spend, we want to win now. Here's a light switch. Boom. That's not how it works anyway. So uh, if you've got the right guy, if you've got Pat Gillick, we saw it happen with Theo. You hand him, you hand him a, a checkbook, and and you and you don't put a limit on it, and and, and you can you can put together a pretty pretty damn good team. Uh, I don't think that's the way Jed operates. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I think it's also it's time to get a little more aggressive than maybe he has done in the past. It is. It is time to go, whether that is Otani or 
Glass now roll the dice or Bieber or Alonzo or Juan Soto or somebody else out there we're not mentioning yet. It's time. It is time to try and win this freaking division and then see what happens. It is certainly time. The question is whether Jed feels it as urgently as you do or other fans do. All right, let me ask you a question. If, it's a big if, if they get super aggressive and the Chicago Cubs, they don't even have to win the World Series, but they win the division, they get to the NLCS, and they look like, wow, that team's set up, young, vibrant, more money to spend next winter. They got a shot to be like, sustain success for a while. Does that redeem Ricketts? And does do his critics go, oh, I got to give you credit. You knew what you were doing or no? To me, that's up to the individual paying fan. Uh, if, if you were fine paying for the second tank job in a decade while you waited for this moment, that's your prerogative. I don't think it's the right thing to do when, as we like to call them, you're the Chicago freaking Cubs. I think, I, I think you should have been. I think you should have returned more value to or attempted. And that's the, that's the thing, right? I think you should have tried more than you did. I think you should have attempted to return more value to your fans. What if he and, says, you know, we were in first place in 21. We made the tough decision to trade away these iconic players. Mm -hmm. Yes, we sucked in 22. We weren't bad at 23 and we're back in 24. That is not a full scale tear down rebuild. We retooled on the fly. What dude, if he said that to you? Dude, the, the 2021 idea of being in first place and then trading everybody away because tough decisions and all that. No way, man. You go back to the previous offseason. You go back to the previous offseason when they dumped Darvish and when they when they dumped for nothing Kyle Schwarber in order to get salary and payroll relief because they were afraid of pandemic losses. So yeah. that's what that is about. Right. Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not let recent events uh, rewrite history. That's what happened then. That's why they did it. So if you want to be fine with that as a fan, because they turned around and this many years later put together that team you just described, more power to you. But that's, that's your problem. Many years, years later, that's quick. I said, however, basically, however, man, I'm not saying it's a, a long or a short amount of time. It depends on your perspective. But this many, this many years later, however many that is, three, four, whatever it is, th th that they've gotten back to the top of the division and an LCS and the whole thing. OK, it, that's I mean, that's good. But that's they should be. They should be doing that all the time. I mean, think about this, Cap, you know. What happened in St. Louis uh, in 2023 stunned a fan base, freaking stunned a fan base. And you could argue stunned the front office because they tried they tried to kind of thread a needle a little bit. I mean, you and I talked before the season. We weren't all all on board with the Cardinals. I certainly wasn't. I thought the Brewers would win it. But and I, and I thought they, you know, their, their, their pitching was was a problem. Turned out to be a problem. Whatever. But the reason that the fan base and maybe even the front office was stunned is because they're always in it because mm -hmm. they're always doing the things to try to win. They do it differently than the Cubs could or maybe should do it because the Cubs are the big market Chicago freaking Cubs. Uh, but nonetheless, that should be the expectation on the North side of Chicago. And when you, and when you, fall off of contention in a given year, you should be stunned. But Gordon, and every now, decision, and, we're making every apology decision and I'm not going to do that. Every decision except Schwarber, and there are some, you know, he hit a buck 80, whatever. Some people wouldn't want that anyway, but he's a hell of a power hitter and a great person. Every single decision they made was right. They wouldn't want Baez back on a bet. They wouldn't want Chris Bryant back. They well, wouldn't want Rizzo it. back. You, 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 you got to keep in mind the context of the moment at the time. Look, man, B Baez is a 
bad contract, a terrible contract for, for yeah. the Tigers. It's it's just a little worse than than the Rockies contract for Bryant. I I didn't think I wasn't sure Bryant would get that much. And 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 it and it took basically two teams were in on him big and the Rockies paid a bunch of money. That's fine. But that doesn't take away the con. I mean, that's you want to make decisions like that. Again, we've we talked about this way back when is, you know, Baez has has and had flaws. And now would would they have come out the way they did in Detroit had he stayed in Chicago? Um, there's all kinds of things about his personality that that make that a legitimate debate. And we could debate that if we want. Um, but in retrospect, if you say, OK, those decisions were right. OK, that doesn't excuse the reason that they made a lot of those decisions and that they asked everybody to be OK with another tank job. So that's what I'm getting at. And, and so uh, it, that in that moment, in that context, was ownership decision, right? Mm -hmm. And then now you layer in the poor job that the front office did of sustaining their roster after starting to win. And, and, and you can, yeah, I don't know how many, uh, mostly there've been mostly good decisions since, but, uh, you know, I, it just doesn't excuse that team in that market with those revenues and that loyal fan base doing what they did in my mind. But if you're okay. a fan, you're okay with that. Okay. That's cool. Okay. As a fan, I was not offended what went on since 21. Not at all. I, I said clearly I wouldn't have kept Chris Bryant. I'm glad they moved on from Baez. Knew. Chris Bryant was gone regardless. What I was disappointed in and thought was unconscionable was when they were still trying to win, making the only move you make, Daniel Descalso. That again. Like 2018. So that, that one, right. I'm like, wait a minute. Your guys are all in their prime. But remember Spend why. Goddamn okay? money and fix your, your hitting. Remember why that is. That goes back to when they went into 2018 and signed, was it? Yeah, into 20. Yeah, went into 2018 and signed Darvish and Chatwood and Brandon Morrow. They spent a lot of money on those guys on multi year right. contracts and got negative war out of the two starters the first year of, of those deals. It meant you had to turn around and trade for Cole Hamels. Yep. And then it also meant that coming out of that season, because you were still in your window, you had to pick up his $20 million contract option. That yep. meant you had no effing money to keep some of the other guys that you might have at that point. And it meant that when you went to sort of replace, um, you know, the, the Rossi guy who became the John Jay guy who became the, it became Daniel Descalzo or I don't know, maybe those are flip flop. I mean, that's who you wind up with because you're, you're looking for a clubhouse edge guy, but you don't have any money to spend anymore because of all these, these incremental decisions that led to this point. Um, so yeah, that bothered me more. All right, before we wrap this up, You'll be down on the ground, boots on the ground, we like to call it in the industry. And you will be in Nashville for the winter meetings. Do you expect the Chicago Cubs to board their jet to come back next Thursday after the Rule 5 draft, I believe? And do you expect them to have made at least one major addition? Yes. Yeah, I, I do because um, it's impressive to me how quickly the market's already moving for pitching. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, Yamamoto has indicated that he might want to get something done sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So uh, wherever he winds up, that could be another uh, a sort of a propulsion of the market. And I do expect activity at the winter meetings across the industry and with the Cubs being in a position they are um, and, and, and sort of being poised to make multiple moves in multiple position areas, I think you'll see a significant player come back with them from Nashville. Did they get Otani? 
<laughs> I do not think they do. No, we already talked about that. No, I, I, I don't. I, I think that they'll, you know, they'll give it their best shot. They gave it a pretty damn good shot the first time around. Um, and, and remember, the first time around, the money really didn't matter because, I mean, relatively speaking, they didn't have as much as some teams. But nobody could spend more than what was it, three million or something like that at the time, right? Uh, because of uh, some of the signing rules. So he wasn't making a decision based on money the first time around, and he chose L.A. over Chicago, even though supposedly he had, uh, uh, you know, a, re a really good sales pitch from Chicago. Go back and look at what he said at the All-Star game when I asked him. Don't believe everything you read. That's what he said, right? Yeah, and, and then and then look look what he said when I asked the follow-up. We, we should drop that in into here. Um, yeah, I'll have to see if we can find that audio still. Yeah. Remind everyone what he said. Yeah, he 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 basically uh, demurred. He, he said, "Don't." don't. I said, uh, "What about the reports that you came close to signing with the the Cubs? And would would you uh, are they attractive to you as a free agent? Don't believe everything you read." I said, "Well, so so what should I believe?" <laughs> and uh, and he would not commit, but it sounded like. My my read on it was that probably it, the interest in the Cubs was overstated. But you can you can judge for yourself. We'll find out. Sometimes they say that to throw everyone off the scent. Could be. I'll throw in a bunch of Malnati's, whatever he needs, man. <laughs> That's what I told Judge a year ago. That was said, so good. Hey, here's here's Cap's number. You got pizza for life in Chicago. Best according to Cap, the the best. By the way, before I let you go, you wanted to mention something about Ryan Flaherty coming to the Cubs as the bench coach. Yeah, right. So Ryan Flaherty, I don't know if anybody remembers Ryan Flaherty. He was a supplemental first round pick of the Cubs under the previous regime. That the, correct. The he was a Hendry pick. Yeah, I know Tim Wilkin running the farm system. Yep, and they liked him a lot. And when the regime turned over, he was on the brink of making the big leagues. Um, but you remember. And you've you've sort of parroted this, especially recently, how how terrible the the organization of the farm system was when Theo and Jed took over. Yeah, until they won with Wilson Contreras and Javi Baez. Those were Henry guys. No, no doubt. And and not only that, but some of the guys they let go, and Ryan Flaherty was one of them. They left Flaherty unprotected in the Rule Five draft. For a for a, a system that they said had no no players of value in it, he immediately got picked up. They got rid of DJ Lemayhew as well. Got threw threw him into a deal with yeah, Tyler the, Colvin. That was a horrible deal. It was and horrible. It, and Theo, to his credit, has admitted that. Right, and and so Flaherty is the other example. He's like he's he's emblematic in my mind of their dismissiveness of what they took over when they came in kind of an arrogant dismissiveness. Like yeah. they just, and, and, and so these players that were in the system, they had no use for them. They didn't like the methodology behind acquiring him, blah, blah, blah. They weren't impact guys, whatever. Flaherty had a pretty damn nice career and he's a heady guy. And now he's a coach in his thirties, pretty well-regarded guy in the game interviewed uh, for the Padres manager's job. And I expect him to be a, a pretty good contributor on this coaching staff. And, and I, I hope he's in Nashville because I want to find him and I want to ask him what he thinks about that. You know, when he's gone and basically proved that regime wrong and now he signed on with them to come back and coach. That's it. I'm, I'm in. If you want yeah, me? I'm right. in. Yeah. Gordon, have a safe trip down there to Nashville and anything breaks, we'll do emergency podcasts. And then we'll, uh, of course, record around your schedule next week right here on our recap podcast. I'm, I'm not available 7 p.m. Friday night. and But we can talk about. Well, once Oregon's got like a three touchdown lead, maybe you'll decide to just jump out. Once once Washington's clinched the, uh, the number two seed in the college football playoffs, we can talk about that. I am Take absolutely that. rooting for Washington. A hundred percent. Two of That's my dear friends, you and Olin Krutz, both are Washington guys. There you go. From, and my daughter-in-law's from Seattle, so all in. My son lives there. It's it's meant to be, man. It's meant to be. Go get him. Have a great trip and uh, all the best. All right. Take care, man.
There he is. That's my partner. That's Gordon Wittenmeyer. And uh, we have our Cubs recap podcast. And of course, again, we'll be from the winter meetings. We'll have any type of breaking news. We'll cover it for you. And we'll have a podcast next week as well. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. We appreciate you watching and listening. Go Washington Huskies and go Cubs. Fly the W. Take that. Woof.